ability talk on how could colonialism and Eurocentrism undermine the response to the planetary emergency. The knowledge for sustainability talks uh, invite uh, you colleagues uh, to take a broader long-term perspective about uh, complex uh, sustainability. Uh, there's an echo somewhere? Or? Okay, can I continue? Okay, sorry uh, for this. So they aim to offer disruptive and uncomfortable wisdom to make EU narratives and policies uh, more uh, robust. So this event is jointly organized by DG Research and Innovation and by EU staff for climate. The event is recorded and the recording will be made available uh, publicly. I think it's a visibility rights problem. So now, uh, problem. I think it's a, it's a we shall look at uh, the economics of post-colonialism uh, and at uh, decolonizing injustices in this talk. Point. The South right. is a demand from suffering point. the consequences and of climate change and environmental uh, destruction. While only having a very limited historic contribution to its causes and continuing to contribute very little to the unfolding disaster uh, today. The EU often presents itself as a global sustainability leader, but there may be some uncomfortable issues not sufficiently on northern radar screens uh, that uh, deserve a conversation as they could undermine the global response to the uh, planetary emergency. Uh, does the green transition uh, of the minority world, as it's often called, the North, come at the expense of the majority world? We'll also look at uh, decolonizing frames, minds, and narratives. How could staff of the EU institution become aware of filters and biases resulting from our embeddedness in post-colonial practices and Eurocentric worldviews? with the aim to develop relevant responses to the planetary emergency. For instance, do research questions and topics in research and innovation agenda uh, primarily focus on perspectives of the North and neglect to better explore opportunities for the South? So here, I think this picture is really uh, a great example of a limited frame where Vanessa, uh, Vanessa Nakate has been cut uh, by Associated Press at the Davos summit out of the picture. We've put, uh, put together uh, for you a great lineup of speakers. Welcome and thank you for accepting our talk. We shall present you in more detail when giving uh, you the floor. So with Luis Ninsima, if you are here, Luis, then please uh, put on your picture. We see you. He will set uh, the scene giving an African perspective on the uh, planetary emergency. Vidya Shaw will present how learning and leadership can unpack systems of oppression, including coloniality and cognitive imperialism. Yamin Saheb will look at sufficiency from a global perspective. Andrew Fanning will share key insights on national responsibilities for ecological breakdown and present compensation models for atmospheric appropriation. The live talks will be complemented by video contributions of Farhana Sultana and Jason Hickel on climate coloniality and economic aspects of post-colonialism. Uh, we shall then have questions and answers, Mr. Speakers. You can submit your questions uh, and vote on your colleagues' questions through Slido. Laurent Montou will draw up uh, conclusions at the end, so please stay with us. Welcome also to our moderators, Aubrey Chatterier, Anna Smedby, who may join us later, and Alexandre uh, Vaché. Due to unforeseen last-minute circumstances, there might be only men in the moderation team. This is not appropriate. I sincerely apologize for this. This was not planned like this. Welcome to all the participants. You were more than 400 who have, uh, uh, who have uh, registered, and we already now have 212 on this call. This is a tremendous interest for uh, this topic. And last but not least, welcome to Jerome Spans for the technical lead, because without you, this session wouldn't have been possible. Thank you very much, and over to you, Obi.
Okay, thank you very much. And I noticed that Luis hasn't yet connected, so we're just going to try and find out where um, uh, uh, where he might be stuck. But in the meanwhile, maybe we can uh, invite you to a uh, quick poll, <coughs> which uh, we are just going to share the um, uh, just, we're just going to share the link with you in the chat, um, and you will see that we're. Um, essentially inviting you to uh, share. Sorry, I'm just trying to get back to the chat. Um, the um, uh, question which we have for you, which is how informed do you feel about the impact of the planetary emergency on countries beyond Europe and North America? So the options are very acutely informed, acutely informed, somewhat informed, hardly informed, or not at all informed. So 20 of you have voted so far. Um, maybe I can just uh, present my screen so that then you can see. Uh, yes, there we are. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to share my screen. So, looking at it in pie chart format, um, then somewhat seems to be more than that, just over half of you. Uh, and acutely informed is 26%. Hardly informed is not much further behind. Uh, not at all. And uh, very acutely informed. Uh, uh, oh, nobody yet very acutely informed. Okay. So, um, before we get too far into the discussion, uh, there are some ground rules which I just need to... Um, remind you of for this session. So before we start, in view of the challenging topics we are likely to discuss, I need to remind you to keep this session as a kind, friendly place for civilised discussion. Always add something positive to the discussion, however small. If you are not sure your post in the chat or your verbal contribution would add to the conversation, Think over what you want to say and try again later. Please be respectful of the topics and the people discussing them, even if you disagree with some of what is being said. You may wish to respond by disagreeing, which is fine, but remember to criticise the ideas, not people. Avoid name-calling, ad hominem attacks, responding to the tone of a comment, instead of its actual content and knee-jerk contradiction. Instead, I would invite you to provide thoughtful insights that improve the conversation for all of us. Now, I'm just looking to Thomas to see whether uh, Luis has joined us by now. Uh, oh, do we have Luis? Okay, so we are uh, we will we are trying to contact uh, Luis, but in the meanwhile, I think Pitya, are you Pitya? Maybe I can just uh, maybe we can move directly to introduce uh, introduce you if that's sure. okay. So um, um, our in, in, in this context, first speaker then is Vidya Shah. She is an educator, scholar, and activist committed to equity and racial justice in the service of liberatory education. She is assistant professor at the Faculty of Education, York University, Ontario, Canada. Vidya, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here with all of you. Um, I can imagine in, in a very different time zone than I'm in. Uh, so hello to everyone. And I'm going to 
just begin by making sure I can share my screen here. Um, is that visible to folks? Yep. Yeah, it is. thank you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, share with you for, for the next 10 minutes or so a little bit about uh, the unleading project, which is um, where the, where the invitation to speak to today came from. Um, and, but in particular, I want to speak about colonialism, coloniality, and um, cognitive imperialism. And I first want to just uh, say thank you to uh, the organizers of this event for the invitation to be here today. Thank you to all of you who are here today and participating in this really important discussion. My role is to set a little bit of a tone around some of the mindsets that are uh, in operation that might prevent us from uh, doing the kind of uh, important, urgent, dramatic, bold work that needs to be done in this moment if we are to really take issues of climate justice seriously. Uh, my work is in uh, education largely, but um, I am surrounded by people uh, in my life who are very committed to climate work um, and have learned a tremendous amount from them. And so I'm going to share with you uh, a, a bit about this project and then jump into some of those ideas. So this project, let me back up, this project, The Unleading Project, is a website and a podcast series. And the uh, concept behind it is that as somebody who was formerly in schools and is now a professor in in, uh, in the academy, I wanted to figure out how we could bridge the gap between uh, what people are thinking about in the academies around very big, complex topics and what can be done on the ground uh, in communities and in classrooms. And so in this project, we ask a couple of main questions. And I, I share these questions with you because I'm inviting you to think about how your uh, assumptions about uh, the work that you're doing in climate is influencing what it is that is happening for you today. And so the first question here is how might we take uh, trouble taken for granted assumptions? This notion of troubling means shaking up. How do we shake up uh, taken for granted assumptions that we have? And so in this case, taken for granted assumptions that we have about climate about who we are as people in this movement, who is who are considered the leaders and who are not considered the leaders in this movement. I would argue everyone on this call who is committed to doing something differently in the work that you do every day to further climate justice is a leader in this work. Um, how might we acknowledge and resist traditional, in this case, leadership, but in your case, climate discourses that reinforce and acknowledge the status, that, sorry, that, that reinforce the status quo? We can't actually work towards changing something, changing the way that we see something unless we first stop and acknowledge how we have been seeing it, until we first acknowledge what are the waters that we are swimming in. How might we center and enact theories and approaches to leadership that have been silenced and marginalized? What some of these traditional ways of seeing the world do is it silences other knowledge systems. And we're going to talk about that. And all of this for the possibility of reclaiming and imagining future possibilities. One of the things that's really important about how we have thought about unleading this notion of undoing the ways that we have been socialized into leadership is to recognize that we are socialized into everything in this world based on intersecting systems of oppression. You'll see here on the right the image is uh, systems of oppression such as white supremacy, capitalism and neoliberalism, Christian hegemony, ableism, colonialism, coloniality, and settler colonialism, and cis heteropatriarchy. Now, these are intersecting systems, each with their own set of logics that make this system possible. But these logics also span multiple, multiple areas. And so what we want to do is we want to make strange these logics. We want to, these are logics that become so normalized and so naturalized in how we live in the world that we don't even know that we're operating in and through them. So we want to make them strange. We want to know them. We want to understand them. And then we want to choose how we want to engage in these ideas differently. 
So we're gonna, if you can see this this uh, image here, the bottom right, colonialism, coloniality, and settler colonialism. We're gonna dive into that uh, particular one again, recognizing that uh, colonialism did not happen and is not happening without Christian hegemony, without white supremacy, without capitalism, and other intersecting systems here. Yeah. So I just want to give a little bit of background around what is colonialism, but we won't spend too much time here because I want to move to uh, another term, actually. So Malefe uh, Asante um, defines colonialism as that which seeks to impose the will of one people on another and the, and the use um, and to use the resources of the imposed people for the benefit of the imposer. So in and of itself, colonization is the action or process of settling and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area, disconnecting them from land, their history, their identity, their rights, and other benefits. And in the colonial imagination, uh, one's proximity to more or less desirable land and one's ability to own land uh, establishes a differential value of human life, serving as justification for a natural, quote unquote, natural order. This is the work of Sil um, Sylvia Winter. And these practices of domination and imposition have given rise to the resistance of the anti-colonial movement, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about later. What has come out of uh, colonialism is this idea of coloniality and cognitive imperialism. And so while colonization is about land and resource and the occupation of land, Malefe Asante reminds us that colonizers did not only seize land, but also mines. So coloniality, as related to but different from colonization, refers to the control and management of knowledge by these quote unquote universals of Western modernity, Eurocentrism, and global capitalism. And so what we are seeing across the world now are similar ways of thinking about the world, similar ways of thinking about and engaging with the world. And that thinking uh, influences who we are and how we live and how we relate to one another. So rooted again in these quote unquote universals at this point of Western modernity, Eurocentrism, global capitalism. And this leads to this notion of cognitive imperialism. So in repudiating other knowledge systems, Marie Batiste argues cognitive imperialism denies people their language and cultural uh, integrity by maintaining the legitimacy of only one language, one culture, one frame of reference. Marie Batiste argues Cognitive imperialism is a term that describes the mental, emotional, destructive, and traumatic effects of the experiences of individuals and peoples forced to be educated and living under Eurocentric colonialism and imperialism. So in order for colonialism to exist, to be upheld as a system of oppression, we have to teach people to think particular ways, to not see particular patterns, to engage the world in, in certain ways that allow for the maintenance of colonialism. And you know, many people think colonialism is something of the past. We, we are seeing it right here, uh, right now in these times. We are seeing it all over the world with the imposition of one people onto another and the ways in which the people who are being imposed upon have to think of themselves in the world. Now, what does this have to do with your work in the EU, thinking about climate in particular? I want to spend just a little bit of time thinking through what are some of the mindsets that uphold this colonial narrative? The first is this notion of neutrality and objectivity. Now, the myth of objectivity and neutrality assumes that there is that, that we all experience the world in the same way. And therefore, there is only one truth. Notions of quote unquote truth often rooted in uh, Judeo-Christian uh, ways of seeing the world, um, uphold the interests and perspectives of those with the power to define that truth, as they have the power to create and uphold dominant perspectives of the other. And so this myth discounts knowledge that is uh, historical, that is contextual, that is specific. It discounts people's experiences 
and it discounts Indigenous knowledges around the world. And so what in our way of engaging with climate work or, or any of the work that you do has been, has, has upheld this idea of there's only one right way to do this and has discounted local knowledge, has discounted contextual specific, locally specific knowledge. The second idea is this notion of knowledge production or the pursuit of knowledge. The idea that something does not exist unless it is quote unquote discovered particularly by those who have positional power or, or particular identities or titles to legitimize this quote unquote discovery. Now, a lot of this comes from uh, the enlightenment area, right? The, the era, this notion of wanting to discover and something the, the notion that something doesn't exist unless somebody else discovers it is similar. You can see these patterns that are similar to land does not exist. Terra nullius, this notion that land does not exist or a people does not exist unless it is, unless it is discovered. Um, by, uh, by, by other particular people. Um, so from this perspective, knowledge is seen as property to be discovered and owned. The third concept is a natural order. Colonial projects associate this quote unquote truth uh, of humanness and differential value of human life with one's proximity to, to land, right? And we, we talked about that earlier. This notion of progress narratives, and this is a big one. Uh, as Natsu Taylor Saito uh, writes, like the origin stories of the other settler states, the progress narratives begins with the arrival of the colonizers, rendering invisible the societies being displaced and replaced, or recasting them as part of the wilderness that is transformed by settlers' civilizing mission. This is a narrative of constant and inevitable progress that asserts its universality and overwrites the stories of all those it encounters. Its world is anthropocentric and hierarch hierarchically structured with humans second only to presumptively made a, a male God who instructs them to exercise dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, for folks who reject the religious framing here um, of the words of Natsu Taylor Saito, the hierarchy nevertheless remains. The civilization or science replacing, uh, you know, on the one hand, it, it could be God that, 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 is, that is, is, is at the top, or it could be civilization and science. Nonetheless, uh, it is the dominion of the humans over all other living things that we have to be thinking about here. Fragmentation and separation. This is in the ability to be able to see ourselves as separate from each other, living, non-living, the past, the future, we create the conditions for dehumanization, for conquest, for imposition, for violence, for environmental degradation, for genocide, for slavery. See, if we're going into another country to help that country, to save that country, to pity that country, to want to be these good charitable people that are going into another country to do good by them, then we see them as separate from us. What climate does is it reminds us that there are no borders. While there are local specificities around how particular communities are being harmed uh, and will be harmed by climate injustice, we have to start breaking down this idea that we are separate individuals, separate nations. We are in this project together, albeit differentially harmed. And that requires us to divest from the sovereign Cartesian, um, the, 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 the sovereign Cartesian white subject from its power to prescribe and prescribe the limits of human civilization. These are the words of um, Coleman. And I think here about um, so much of what this work does is it reminds us that the separation of body and mind that is uh, central to the Cartesian project that we are, the, our, our body is separate from our mind, is separate from our soul, spirit, whatever it, whatever it is that you want to call it, that inner part of us. As we separate ourselves in these ways, what that does to us is it challenges our ability to actually be in this project with, we are, we are, this is existential. This is an existential crisis we are up against. There is collective grief that we need to make space for here. Our world is literally burning. And the people who actually have the capacity to hold that grief, to work with that grief, 
and to allow that grief to move through their bodies in ways that allow them to think of different orientations and solutions to this work, who are really willing to see where we are and what is happening because it feels like an existential threat. Those of us that have the capacity or are building the capacity to hold that grief and not get stuck in that grief are able to actually offer bold, courageous, urgent solutions that are needed in this time. I'll end here with this uh, final slide. And I, I want to offer some suggestions from anti-colonial theory. I know that our, our title is looking at the ways in which post-colonial theory undermines this work. And I'd like to offer that we are, we are, we are not post-colonial. Colonialism is operating all around the world right now. There are many nations, communities, indigenous peoples who, who in which Canada is, is an example. We are a settler colonial state. The settlers never left our state. Um, and many more have come uh, on top, on, in, in addition to uh, the original settlers who, who, who settled the land. Anti-colonial theory is asking for a fundamental shift and redoing of how we live and relate to one another challenging the coloniality of knowledge production, recognizing that power relations are established by dominance and subordination, looking for that dominance and subordination and actively shifting it, really valuing local experience, knowledge systems and voice, recognizing that spirituality and spiritual knowing is central to how we will move through these times. A politics of resistance, a politics of accountability, and a politics of responsibility, seeking out and interrogating how colonialism intersects with all of these other systems of oppression, capitalism, Christian hegemony, all of these, and acknowledging the resistance to injustice and the survival of indigenous ways of knowing and being has been what has been at play since the start of colonialism. I want to say thank you very much. And as I do share with you that these are some of the podcast topics in Unleading, I encourage you to take a look and share any feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you, Obi. Yeah. Uh, to you, Obi. Or perhaps Luis is with us. No? Thank you. Uh, yeah, not, unfortunately, Luis is not able to join us. So instead, uh, what we've um, uh, what we've arranged is that Thomas is just going to introduce uh, a recording of uh, Vanessa Nakate. So Thomas, Lydia, thanks a lot. What you just told us was so important, and thanks for having been with us. So yeah. Vanessa Nakate has been uh, inspired by uh, Greta Thunberg and is probably one of the most uh, prominent uh, climate activists uh, from Africa. She has uh, created the Youth for Africa, uh, for Future Africa uh, movement and the Africa-based uh, Rise Up movement. She's been uh, two days ago in uh, the European Parliament, invited by the Greens in conversation with our new climate commissioner, Hukstra. We'll put the video in the chat because really the debate is uh, uh, very interesting. But uh, instead of Luis, we will uh, show you uh, her speech to the uh, MEPs two days ago. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, when I was a little girl, my father taught me the importance of trust. That in order for people to trust you, you have to keep your word. That trust is not something that you can simply claim. It is something you must earn. Last week, my father went to a political rally at Entebbe Airport in Uganda for a cause he believes in. Even though there were risks, he went because he felt it was important to show up and stand up for what he feels is right. He was arrested at the rally and taken to a police station. I am here at my family's home in Kampala, 
helping to take care of him. But we are just 50 days from COP28. And so I feel that I must also show up. I must also stand for what is right. So I'm here to speak with you. The climate crisis has arrived. The scientists at World Weather Attribution tell us that the extreme heat Europe experienced this July would have been virtually impossible if humans had not warmed the planet by burning fossil fuels. And of course, it's not just Europe that is suffering. The great forests of Canada are turning to ash. Typhoon Haikui deluged Hong Kong with the heaviest rain since records began. And Storm Daniel devastated huge sections of the city of Dana in Libya. In the middle of the night, thousands of people were dragged out to sea and drowned. Can you imagine their terror? Fossil fuels are destroying our communities. Fossil fuels are destroying our economies. Fossil fuels are destroying our future. Continuing to look for more coal, oil and gas to dig up and burn is incompatible with a safe planet. The International Energy Agency has said so. The UN Secretary General has said so. Your very own scientists at the European Scientific Advisory Body on Climate Change have said so. We had Commissioner Hoekstra tell you during his hearing that he hopes to act together in full equality with our friends from the Global South. I welcome the spirit of Commissioner Hoekstra's comment. Full equality would be well received. Creating full equality depends on creating trust. And trust is not claimed, it is earned. The EU Parliament has already committed to end fossil fuel subsidies, finally deliver the long overdue $100 billion of climate finance for vulnerable countries, and call for a phase out of all fossil fuels at COP28. I say all fossil fuels because the EU's level of ambition currently is to call for the phase out of unabated fossil fuels only. Now first, let us be really honest about what is meant by unabated. It is a code for carbon capture and storage or CCS. CCS is not a solution. CCS is a fairy tale. CCS is not commercially available and will not be viable for many years. And while CCS technology may one day capture very small amounts of CO2 emissions, it will not capture particulate matter, ammonia and nitrogen oxide that are released when you burn fossil fuels. So even if carbon emissions could be captured, millions of people will continue to die prematurely from air pollution every single year. Millions of people dying needlessly, tragically, every year so that a few rich countries can become even richer. Does this sound like a solution to you? What CCS does is offer the fossil fuel industry a peer lifeline to keep developing new coal, oil, and gas reserves for short-term profit. So when the EU keeps its promise of calling for a fossil fuel phase-out at COP28, the EU must reject the fossil fuel lobby's deceitful efforts to attach the word unabated. The EU must push for a phase out that is fast and fair and encompasses all fossil fuels without discounts. And don't believe the fossil fuel industry's lies about the need for oil and gas for development. They have been promising to lift people out of energy poverty for decades. If fossil fuels really delivered energy access, Nigerians would not be suffering from an extreme lack of access to electrical energy. So I'm here to ask the EU 
to call for a just and equitable phase out of all fossil fuels at COP28. Demand that each business sector plays its role in the fossil fuel phase out, including the fashion industry, which is using more and more oil and gas to create huge volumes of fast fashion, which is then, which is then dumped and burned in communities in Africa. Ensure all European banks and fossil fuel companies like Total stop all new fossil fuel development in Africa. If you only decide to act because of the economy, so be it. New research has just been published by the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. It says that half of our economies could be destroyed by 2070. Let me emphasize that again, 50% of GDP. But I'm told that the EU wants to do not only what is right for the economy, but what is right for people too. I am told the EU wants to be a partner to Africa and climate vulnerable countries across the global south. We who live on the front lines of the climate crisis want to believe this, but the truth is that we have been receiving mixed messages and broken promises for a while now. I understand the demands I have come here with will not be easy. The fossil fuel industry is powerful and will do everything it can to chalk every final bit of short-term profit. Big Oil and their lawyers will be out in force at COP28. Countries beholden to the fossil fuel industry will try to delay and block. But if you truly want to be a partner for Africa, you will show up. If you truly want to be a partner for Africa, you will keep your word, whatever the risks. This is what my father told me. This is what he demonstrated once again last week. He showed up. He kept his word, whatever the risks. My father taught me well. Trust is not claimed. It must be earned. So I ask you now, the policy makers of Europe, can we trust you? Can I ask Commissioner Hoekstra if he sees this? Will you commit to calling for a fossil fuel phase out? without discount. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. So, uh, Thomas, I think it's over to you now, um, because I think uh, Yumina is ready to be introduced. I suggest uh, that I have a little, yeah, exactly, Yamina. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am delighted that there is this debate at the EU as someone who uh, is uh, at the same time. Sorry, from... maybe, Amina, I should present you. If okay, I thank you. you. Okay. Uh, just uh, <laughs> with one uh, word. So, Yamina Saheb, we are so happy to have you here. We are senior energy policy analyst at OpenX with a specific expertise on sufficiency. You're also researcher and lecturer at the Institut d'Etudes Politique Paris. And uh, you are lead, uh, one of the lead authors of the IPCC sixth assessment report. So if anybody has a very specific uh, question about the climate, the climate science, then we'll uh, direct this uh, to you. And you will uh, speak today about sufficiency for whom a global perspective. Yamina, go ahead. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I am delighted to be here because I am uh, French and Algerian at the same time. So uh, I uh, I experience the colonialism. It's it's in every day, and always I always question myself in which side I am, uh, and what the history did to me uh, actually. So, uh, but today we talk about sufficiency and uh, before digging deeper to sufficiency, as I'm not sure that all of you know what sufficiency is, 
I managed uh, to include sufficiency definition in the IPCC report, and this is the definition that is based on the review of the literature. So sufficiency uh, is maybe unknown to most of you because it does not appear in any of the EU instruments. It does not exist. Uh, however, sufficiency has been introduced in the French energy transition law in 2015, but without definition. So when I joined the IPCC, the first question I was asked was, what is this sufficiency? In French, we use the word sobriété. And by looking to the literature, I ended with this definition. So basically, sufficiency are, are policies, are the policy measures and the daily practices. And it's the order in which these two, these two concepts appear is very really important. So first, the policies that unleash the daily practices. And you will notice that the word behavior change does not appear because behavior change is the consequence of the daily practices that are unleashed by the policies. So what the policymakers should focus on is policies. Um, to unleash these uh, daily practices. And what these policies do is to avoid the demand for all natural resources. In the French understanding of sufficiency, it was mainly about energy. Now they are, the government is extending to water, but actually it's about all natural resources. And uh, this definition is based on a paper where I explained that it should be all the natural resources and not just energy. And two important components of sufficiency that were not considered before is that sufficiency is about delivering human well-being for all. It does not matter if you are a G, uh, citizen of a G7 country, if you are white or black or whatever, female or male, we all have, uh, we should all have access to decent living standards uh, and we have requirements defined for decent living standards. But for the IPCC summary for policymakers, I ended using human well-being because decent living standards is a scientific frame framework that is not known in the policy uh, circle. And another important component is that these policies should consider planetary boundaries. And I will focus on these two last, last points for, uh, for, uh, for this seminar. So what does that mean, human well-being for all? And uh, I couldn't unfortunately include my recent work that is not yet, yet published, so I have to limit myself to the work that is already available online. Um, so this is what I did include in the IPCC report. So well-being for all, uh, let's look at, for example, residential buildings. So we all know we have here what is in gray is the historical uh, floor area per capita. And you have all world regions here as defined in the IPCC. So of course we know that today in Africa, for example, they have less floor area per capita than we do have in Europe. Uh, the EU is part of this block. Uh, I would accept this as a heritage of our heritage, but then what did bother me really is when I discovered that these are the scenarios for the future. So uh, the blue one is the IA current policy scenarios and uh, the, the orange one that you see here is the IA sustainable development scenario. And then uh, you have uh, this, the other two are scenarios that are developed by scientific community that are not very well known. And what did really bother me is to realize that for 2050, they do project more floral area for the Western people, for the global north, what we call global north in the IPCC context. So you look at Europe and Eurasia and you look at uh, North uh, North America, what is it? North America is even worse than us. And they do project bit of an increase in the floor area per capita in Africa, but they will never reach what we have, which is already above the planetary boundary. And they will show you why it is above the planetary boundary. In, if I focus a little bit on the EU, why it is above the planetary boundary. So, and this is why I started thinking that the famous uh, claim, uh, um, claim, uh, climate mitigation scenarios that are considered aligned with the Paris Agreement, actually they are fully misaligned with the Paris Agreement from equity perspective. They, they are aligned only from temperature target by the end of the century, but this temperature target is achievable only if we colonize the atmosphere and we colonize the land of the, of the global south. Because all these scenarios, they meet the, the temperature target by considering carbon capture and storage, so negative emissions. And when I look to the details of negative emissions, so the land will be taken outside our our space, our administrative space. So that was really shocking for me. And then 
if I looked to a uh, little bit in the EU, in an, it's not an IPCC report, it's in a policy brief that I prepared for uh, European Environmental Bureau. So what, do, what would this floor area per capita would mean in the case of the European countries? And the surprise for me was that to see that, so this is uh, the average, the global average in the IA negative emissions scenario, uh, it's 35, but actually uh, the, um, the decent living standards framework, which is scientific play framework, sets the floor area per capita in residential buildings to 30 square meter per capita. So this is the one that we should be looking on without negative emissions. And we see that the countries that we are used to consider as very sustainable, like Denmark, uh, Scandinavian countries, actually they are not at all when you consider sufficiency. Because these countries, they are sustainable, they are techno solutionist countries, including France, um, and the, they do not consider at all the impact of their activities. So this is for uh, residential buildings, but now I have done similar work for uh, mobility of the people. They do not look at their impact on the, in the environment and their impact on the environment goes beyond their administrative borders because it's about uh, ecological and climate uh, crisis. And actually the countries that would, uh, that would be, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that work better from sustainability perspective when you consider sufficiency are Eastern European countries. But we have to be very careful because in Eastern European countries, there is uh, the share of the households facing uh, living in overcrowded houses is, is very high. So we have to be careful when we talk about sufficiency. While in uh, Western countries, these countries, the richest ones, uh, the share of the population of households living in under-occupied houses is extremely high. And the, the more we are aging, the more our population is aging, the more the share of these households is increasing because it's in these countries that people you have uh, retired people who are living in large houses, etc. So even if you dig deeper to the EU, you see that uh, it is problematic what we have because we don't have sufficiency measures. So this is to look at the uh, the lower uh, the lower part of the the lower band of the sufficiency. Now, if I look at the upper part, and for the upper part, I have done calculations for um, uh, for the EU and the different and the several other countries. So what I look to is if we consider planetary boundary, what would be uh, when when we should be a climate neutral or carbon neutral, you know, I used only carbon control. So the European Union that we see here is EU 28 because I did these calculations with uh, in 2018. Uh, and we see that we should be carbon neutral uh, by 2033. While our target, even our target with the UK is 2050. What does that mean? It means that all our emissions between 2033 and 2050 are possible only if the rest of the world does not emit at all. We are colonizing the atmosphere. This is what it means. And if I do uh, the additional work that I have done that I cannot show today because it's not yet published, uh, is that I did calculate this with because that was for the previous carbon budget that the one that was published by the IPCC in 2018. So now this budget, the budget with that we have today is even lower. So this means that most likely this means that the data I have actually it's a bit lower. It's even less than 2033. It's around here that actually we should be carbon neutral. So. This means uh, it's quite shocking to see that even the climate neutrality target, the way it has been set, and I agree with the first speaker, it, it is done in this way because the whole knowledge on this climate neutrality target is Western knowledge and does not take into account at all uh, equity issues. So all the scenarios that you see that, uh, that the scientific community has submitted to the IPCC, they do not take into account at all equity issues. They do project for us more cumulative emissions than in Africa, for example. And they do project less access to energy, even if some of the scenarios are labeled sustainable development scenarios, than for Africans in the future. And it's just something that you cannot, we cannot go into climate negotiations with this kind of work, actually. So it's really for me, um, 
coloniality of um, colonizing the atmosphere. And what it means in practice, I, I, I did not dig to the details. It means that I know it means that the rest of the world should not uh, emit no emissions at all. But when you say no emissions at all in the rest of the world, which did not contribute to the climate crisis. So this means basically no life at all in the rest of the world. This is what we are doing with our climate neutrality targets. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yamina. Uh, I'd like to remind the participants that if they want to raise questions, they can do so on Slido. So please uh, go to the link in the in the chat box, and uh, you can write questions there, uh, and also vote for the questions that you that you like. And it's my pleasure now also to introduce Farana Sultana uh, as a video, actually, because uh, we are sorry she couldn't be with us uh, live today, and she apologizes for having to decline at a short notice. Uh, Farana Sultana is a professor at Geography and Environment uh, Department of uh, Syracuse University in US. She's also research director on environmental conflict and collaboration. So her speech at the European Parliament Beyond Growth uh, Conference uh, provided a majority world perspective at the biophysical limits to growth. Thank you. So now we can proceed with the video. So I, I want to launch into what I want to say in terms of what we know, uh, what economists have provided us, uh, and also provides a slightly different um, analysis here. So as has been discussed here and elsewhere, we know that climate breakdown results from extraction, overproduction, and overconsumption that are unequally and inequitably distributed around the world, largely because of historical factors that produce these systems. The global crossing of planetary boundaries that Johan talked about, however, is not the same everywhere, nor contributed to by everyone, as other co-panelists have pointed out. The unevenness of the outcomes of growth have far-reaching consequences, both in terms of who benefits, where, why, and how. So first of all, the capitalist elite everywhere are over-consuming and leading the charge, you know, in their yachts that Dan showed us. They lead the charge to colonize minds into desirable outcomes, what you should be like, what you should aspire to do. And as a result, that model of hyper-consumption, extractivism, and a discard culture throws away everything that we actually need to sustain ourselves and the planet. These elitists uh, participate in accumulation by dispossession, resulting not only in disproportionate capitalist benefits from resource control and promotion of neocolonialist policies, but contribute to ecological harms, biodiversity crises, water pollution, air pollution, and climate breakdown that they don't really experience firsthand every day. So the boundaries that are being crossed are primarily being led by capitalist elites everywhere, but also entire countries of the global north or the high energy industrialized economies, causing disproportionate societal and ecological harms to more marginalized communities often elsewhere. The extraction and discard culture embedded in these processes and economic models continue not just natural resources, exploitation, but also the destruction of human lives and potentials, resulting in a discard for the care economy and ecosystem resilience, and often just lip service to basic welfare of billions caught in exploitative and neocolonial labor relations with global capital and extractive resource-based trade that causes irreversible harms. The average citizens, many of you here today, primarily in, based in or from nor, global north countries and increasingly elsewhere, are also, all of us, are participating in this hyper-consumptive lifestyle and are locked into systems of energy use via infrastructure, transportation, and agricultural modes of production that folks often feel are outside of their direct control. 
But as Julia has shown us, this is clearly not the case. We can and do have like regulatory changes. We need cultural shifts and policy changes and understand the wider political economy in order to hold climate justice, global societal equity and sufficiency at the heart of what we can foster and change and grow in order to allow systemic and structural shifts that are indeed very much needed. So delinking growth from well-being has been prom promoted by proponents of degrowth, particularly confronting the endless growth and extractivism models practiced increasingly everywhere, but primarily in powerful and rich countries. These may be challenging to accomplish quickly, but they are not impossible. It is always a question of intent and action and of decision-making power. The worlds we inhabit did not just appear. This is not gravity. It was made to happen through particular formations of colonialism, imperialism, and the capitalism of the last few centuries. It is a destructive fossil fuel-based growth paradigm, the bill for which has been paid historically by ecosystems and black and brown communities of the majority world or the global south largely across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Many parts of the majority world that were historically colonized and exploited, the citizens are increasingly being encouraged to aspire to hyperconsumption, whereby material goods and high energy usage have limited the terms of the debate on what well-being can actually be, because the pursuit of ever higher GDP growth rate has been conditioned to be the only model of prosperity. There is obviously no doubt that having sufficient water, food, housing, education, employment and health care are critically essential and just, yet often impossible or insufficient given global maldistribution of resource use and power relations. However, with international development and globalization models and ever increasingly media and pop culture and domestic policies around the world being influenced by international donors and actors and policymakers, more and more countries and communities across the global south are being influenced to be aspirational or to mimic the unsustainable Eurocentric and Western lifestyles and habits of cultures of hyperconsumption and disposal, even though it has been established that the current models of capitalist development logics cannot continue unabated at all. Such ideologies actually often go against indigenous and local cultures and practices of sufficiency, care, commoning, sustainability, and reciprocity, which were and continue to be eroded and devalued. These colonial capitalist renditions of modernity that are often spurring on high energy desires and pursuit of ever higher and destructive GDP, the entire model which was in, established during colonialism and maintained through global policies, trade, imperial forces and so on, post-World War II are simply not possible. The speed of mitigation actually that's needed in the global north is not fast enough to change to keep up with the planetary boundary strains. So, so the rest of the world is facing increasing loss and damages in real time as externalities of capitalist growth are ex uh, increasingly externalized and exported to more and more marginalized, marginalized communities and groups of people. At the same time, biophysical resources globally are not always available to everyone spatially and societally in equitable manners to pursue even basic well-being. The colonization of the atmosphere and planetary resources by the powerful skew what is a, accessible and available to others. The justice implications are naturally extensive and enduring ever since the Industrial Revolution, whereby the unequal ecological exchange of resources from the majority world to the global north resulted in drains of not just resources that are material and economic, but also structured a world economy that continues to rely on exploitation of resources and peoples from marginalized communities as if that is the norm and nothing else is plausible.
So scholars have tried to quantify this unequal ecological exchange to demonstrate how destructive it is and that we need to imagine other worlds. They have called it the ongoing colonial plunder of resources from the global south to the global north, one that contributes to overdeveloping the latter at the expense of the former. Such processes continue various colonial patterns of harm and dispossession from the past and into the future with increasing debt burdens to poorer countries and communities while there is a funneling up of benefits to a few. These same communities are also the ones at the front lines facing deeper and longer standing climate breakdown and are rendered multiply vulnerable. As societies extract, produce, transport, consume and dispose at greater quantities and at greater speeds, it is impossible to expect the system to not buckle or shift in unforeseen ways if the same pathway is pursued. The challenges to intergenerational justice must include intragenerational and spatial justice inclusive of accounting of impacts to the global south. Reductions of material and energy throughput is necessary in the global north for climate justice, ecological justice and true decolonization and abol abolition justice in the global south and increasingly everywhere. Thus, any discussion of moving beyond growth needs to reckon more critically with unequal contributions to the crisis, as well as how we can discursively and materially foster other notions of well-being and prosperity be beyond GDP growth and hyperconsumption to more practically and equitably encourage alliances and real solidarities with social movements across the global south, from which lessons can be learned, trialed, unlearned and relearned as feminist, decolonial, anti-colonial, anti-racist and anti-imperial scholars and activists of degrowth, post-growth and post-development have demonstrated, such analyses must also contend with the intersectional impacts and outcomes as well as alternative models of flourishing that exist but are often unheeded or discarded. This includes attention to intersections of gender, race, class, and so on, and the ways in which the epistemologies and praxis of well-being and prosperity prosperity occur on the ground. Such concerns need to be accounted for in any discussion of planetary limits and boundaries, as it's always a question of by whom, for whom, where and where. So in conclusion, addressing going beyond growth necessitates real engagement with Global South, Indigenous and decolonial scholarship, activism and perspectives to be integrated and centered to support revolutionary potentialities as possible pathways for Forward. The crises of climate coloniality and unrealistic growth straining planetary boundaries is one of lack of democracy in economic organization and planning, of institutional policy priorities and geopolitical power relations, but also one of ontological and epistemological shifts at scale that include different visions and models that prioritize futures not based on colonial and imperial utopias of endless capitalist growth on a finite planet, but one that focuses on restoration, reparation, caring, dignity, and flourishing for all. Thank you so much. Okay, that was a video by, um, by Farana uh, Sultana. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Fanning, uh, Andrew, you're here with us live uh, you, while you're setting your, your slides. I don't know if you have any, but uh, uh, I will introduce you. You are research and data analysis lead at the Donuts Economics Action Lab, uh, Oxford, and working with Kate Roiworth and her team. Uh, you're also visiting research fellow at Sustainability Research Institute, the School of Earth and Environment uh, of the University of Leeds. And you will talk to us uh, about the national responsibilities for ecological uh, breakdown and about compensation for atmospheric appropriation. The floor is yours, uh, Andrew. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me all. It's an honor to be here today. Thanks to everyone for this, this important gathering. And I would like to share some results uh, that try to make visible national historical responsibilities for the climate and ecological crises that we face. But I was thinking with the purpose of, of today that it would be worth 
letting me share a bit of my personal story in the spirit, it's not something I normally do, but in the spirit of recognizing the influence of colonialism on our lives, as we, as I can really relate to what Yamina mentioned, like how is it affecting us and becoming more aware of our own biases. So I'm currently sitting in Spain, which is where my partner and my two daughters were born, but I was born in Canada in a city called Halifax, which was established as a British settler colony. And Halifax is in Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and I acknowledge them as the past, present and future caretakers of the land of my birth. But my father was born in a different Canadian city called Ottawa, where his side of the family is of Irish and British descent, settled there for several generations. And Ottawa is on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, and I recognize the Algonquins as the customary stewards of the Ottawa River watershed and its tributaries. Now, my mother immigrated to Canada for university from Guyana, which is a country in South America next to Venezuela that Europeans also colonized, bringing enslaved Africans and then indentured East Indians to work on their plantations. And the lands that she grew up on were originally settled by at least nine Amerindian nations, including the Arawaks and the Caribs, whose populations were decimated during the colonial era or in that period, I'm, I'm responding to Vidya's comment that we are still in a colonial era. But Guyana was finally granted political independence from the British in 1966 when my mother was 10 years old. And her side of the family is of Portuguese and East Indian descent, and she has nine siblings, most of whom are now grandparents living in Canada, although they generally married to Guyanese or Caribbean partners. So I have a gazillion cousins and second cousins with ties to Barbados and Grenada and Jamaica and Trinidad and more. And I share these personal details because an otherwise invisible part of my identity is closely tied to the vibrant Caribbean community in Canada, and this has had a deep influence on my life. And it's also been an ongoing journey for me to, to begin recognizing and coming to terms with the privilege and the benefits that I receive as a Canadian-born, white-passing man. So I invite everyone to who is here to consider where you are today, right? Where your families have roots, to recognize that it has very likely been the site of human activity since time immemorial. And we can consider how our ancestors have had relations with other peoples and how we too will one day be ancestors. So for me, that's, that's a big inspiration to make what we do in the present worthwhile so that we can leave a good legacy and, and inheritance for those to come. So on that note, let me walk through some of our research, which tries to make visible some of, some of these issues in, in a small way, and then I'm looking forward to the discussion. So let me share my screen, a moment of truth, where hopefully everything works. You're yeah. okay. Yeah, okay, then let me just dive right in and start with the Global Donut, which was created by my colleague Kate Rayworth, which shows a world dangerously out of balance, where billions of people are not meeting their most essential needs for food, education, political voice, and more. And yet humanity's collective level of resource use is placing massive pressure on our planetary home. It's, we're overshooting multiple planetary boundaries for climate change, biodiversity loss, and others. So this image tells us that the current system needs to be fundamentally transformed to bring us into the donut from both sides at the same time. And it wasn't designed for this challenge. So we need new policies, new models, and new metrics that are fit for these troubled times, and especially a new mindset that can take us there. But if we actually want to design and apply new policies for specific places, then it becomes clear that this global picture is missing some important context because we are discussing we, we're discussing today, it's like we know humanity is not a single entity. There are vast inequalities in the lived experiences of people both within and between countries. And one way to unpack and make visible these differences is by comparing country performance with respect to the donut as across as many indicators and countries as possible. And this is what we did in a recent study that covered nearly 150 countries. So here's a set of those countries plotted by the overall extent of ecological overshoot beyond their fair shares of planetary boundaries, compared to the overall extent of 
social shortfall below the social foundation. We want to be in the green area in the top left, where no country currently is, meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And as we all know, these stories, these countries, they're not living totally separate realities. Their stories are deeply interconnected through history and through power, through history of colonialism, military and corporate power, and current relations of debt and trade rules that are skewed in favor of the global north, through ongoing destruction of ecosystems, extraction of resources, and the impacts of climate change, which are overwhelmingly being driven by overconsumption of the richest, and yet their impacts are being felt first and hardest by the most vulnerable. So there's an urgent need to, to reimagine what it means to achieve human prosperity in the 21st century, century with a new vision. So how can low-income countries like Kenya or Uganda or Malawi rise up towards, towards getting into the donut without shooting past? Because that would be a pathway that has never been taken before. And how can middle-income and emerging countries like China and Turkey pursue a new vision that reorients their economies 90 degrees away from the growth-based trajectory, which has also never been traveled before. And then let's think of the high-income countries in the, in the European Union, where we're landing today, or Canada, the United States, and others. They too need a lot of ambition and humility to undertake an unprecedented transformation, meeting all the needs of their people, in many cases for the first time, while massively reducing resource use to come back within planetary boundaries. And that's never been done. It's a new journey, requires new vision, new ambition, and new policies. And there's also a clear need to rebalance that unjust international system that we have inherited. And that means taking responsibility and making reparations, redistributing wealth extracted unjustly through colonialism and disproportionate appropriation of the global commons. But of course, there's more to it than that even that can be rebalanced. There are unjust debts. We can redesign international financial institutions, rebalancing voice in global governance and more. But let me just focus an example on, on some of our research looking at climate change. Here are some high level findings from a recent study where we analyze the responsibility for climate change across nearly 170 countries. So we started by recognizing that the planet's atmosphere is a commons. It's a gift from nature that everyone should be able to access equitably and sustainably. And we also know from climate science that there's only so much carbon that can be released into the atmosphere to achieve a given climate target, such as keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we divided up global carbon budgets for 350 parts per million, 1.5 and 2 degrees warming these different targets across countries based on their population sizes. And we wanted to know how much each country has emitted in comparison to their fair shares historically, and also together with a business as usual scenario, if we keep heading on as we're going, and a scenario where it decarbonizes from current levels to net zero by 2050. And under this net zero scenario, where all countries reduce emissions to zero by 2050, we find the world could limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And that is, that's crucial to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. But again, the world is not a single entity. And we find that the global north, which includes 39 countries in our analysis, the EU, United States, and others, would overshoot its collective share of the carbon budget by, th by around three times in this scenario which would be appropriating half of the Global South's fair share in the process. And this is deeply unjust in my view, because it effectively, it forces low emitting countries to mitigate far more rapidly than would otherwise be required, effectively foregoing their fair shares to balance the excess of over emitting countries. Now, of course, sacrificing fair shares of, of the carbon budget, it wouldn't be so unjust if emitting carbon didn't bring such clear benefits, at least historically, because we have inherited deeply fossil dependent economies. And this chart shows cumulative carbon emissions with respect to 1.5 degree fair shares and GDP per capita, both from 1960 to 2018. Now there's some variation here, but the general trend shows a clear increase of around $10,000 per capita in GDP for each additional unit beyond their fair share. So these findings support the view that the overshooting countries have tended to enrich themselves through appropriating more than their fair shares of the atmospheric commons. And so building on that, 
we use carbon prices from IPCC scenarios that limit, limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And we valued those excess emissions beyond fair shares in monetary terms. And we calculated that over emitting countries would owe a total of nearly $200 trillion to the rest of the world by 2050 to compensate for their excess of in a world that actually achieves net zero by 2050. And we proposed a mechanism that distributes these funds to low emitting countries based on how much of their fair shares would be appropriated by over emitting countries. So if a country has had more of its fair share appropriated, then it would be entitled to receive more compensation. And similarly, if a country has overshot more of its fair share, then it would be liable to pay more compensation. And the numbers are truly staggering, as you can see. There's no question to me that the annual per capita receipts would be just truly transformative for many Global South countries. Although it, of course, raises many questions about practical implementation. So maybe that's a good place to leave it for now. And I'm looking forward to questions in the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. So we have uh, one more speaker before we go into the queue. I'll share the link uh, in the chat in a minute to the slider where you can ask questions and answers. But our final speaker is Jason Hickel, professor at the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, as well as being a visiting senior fellow at the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics. He's an eminent scholar on degrowth and on post-colonialism, and he's coordinator of the European Research Council Synergy Grant on a post-growth deal. Now, Jason apologizes that he can't be with us live today, but we envisage another event with him in spring 2024. Instead, we have an excerpt from his keynote at the opening plenary at the recent Beyond Growth Conference at the European Parliament. Jerome, I think you are. Set. Yes, there you go. From the political parties. Um, I, I want to use my time with you to speak directly and practically to the extraordinary impasse that we clearly face as a civilization. We are at 1.2 degrees of global warming, and already the effects are clearly disastrous. Devastating planetary changes are playing out before us in real time. It is critically important that we make every effort to limit global warming to as close to 1.5 degrees as possible in line with the Paris Agreement. Scientists warn that pushing beyond this level towards two degrees is likely to trigger several major tipping points in the Earth system. And beyond this level, we will not be able to adapt. Yes, over the past decade, the EU has reduced its emissions. Some politicians have hailed this as evidence of green growth. But remember, when it comes to climate mitigation, what matters is speed. We must reduce emissions fast enough to stay within fair shares of the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. For high-income countries, this is extremely challenging because they have very high levels of energy use, uh, and high energy use makes sufficiently rapid decarbonization very difficult to achieve. The EU is not on track to meet its Paris obligations, not even close. At existing rates of mitigation, it will take several hundred years to cut emissions to zero. Even if the Green Deal brings everyone to the speed of the best performing countries, Denmark and the Netherlands, the EU will still blow its fair share of the carbon budget many times over. There's nothing green about this. It's a recipe for disaster. Much faster mitigation is needed. And climate is not the only crisis that we face. We're also overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including staggering rates of biodiversity loss, driven mainly by excess material use in the world economy. And here again, it's the high-income countries, which have disproportionately high levels of material use, which are overwhelmingly responsible for driving this crisis. What's more, the constant hunt for capitalist growth in the EU and other high-income economies relies on a constant plunder of goods and resources and labor from the Global South. Input-output data shows that consumption in rich countries 
Uh, about half of all of material consumption in rich countries is net appropriated from the global south through unequal exchange. This drains poorer countries of wealth that could be used for development. It colonizes their lands. It produces global inequality. And it means the social and ecological costs of growth are externalized to vulnerable communities. <laughs> This arrangement is wildly destructive and wildly unjust. The science is very clear. Rich countries must substantially reduce their use of energy and materials so that we can decarbonize fast enough uh, to stay under 1.5 degrees, so that we can reverse other forms of ecological breakdown, and to release the global south from the grip of neocolonial extraction. But this brings us to a paradox. Europe has extremely high levels of energy and material use, vastly overshooting planetary boundaries, and yet nonetheless still fails to meet many basic human needs. 40 million people cannot access nutritious food and cannot heat their homes. 95 million people face the risk of poverty. Tens of millions more cannot access decent housing. Why? It's because our economic system is fundamentally undemocratic. Our productive capacities are controlled by capital and mobilized around what is profitable to capital rather than what is necessary for human well-being and ecology. So we end up with perverse forms of production, SUVs and fast fashion and fossil fuels and advertising instead of public transit, nutritious food, renewable energy, affordable housing. Our economic system fails in both ecological and social terms. So we face a double challenge. We need to transition to an economy that meets human needs and achieves social progress, while also substantially reducing energy and material use. <laughs> Some of this can be achieved through efficiency improvements, yes, and we should embrace the power of technological change. But we also know that this is not enough in and of itself. In a growth-oriented economy, gains from efficiency are diminished by the scale effects of ever-increasing production. If we are to overcome this problem and achieve our ecological goals, we need to transition to a post-growth economy and reorganize production around well-being and ecology. So... Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, well, uh, sorry that again that Jason couldn't be here uh, in person. Uh, but there is a second part. Some will say that sounds utopian, but the policies I've mentioned here happen to be extremely popular. Universal public services, a public job guarantee, more equality, an economy focused on well-being and ecology rather than growth. Polls and surveys show strong majority support for these ideas and official citizens' assemblies in several European countries have called for precisely this kind of transition. A post-growth deal along these lines can be a popular and feasible political agenda. But Europe is not an island. Addressing our global crises requires that all countries succeed or none of us do. Governments in the global south also need the freedom to mobilize their own production around human needs and ecological objectives, rather than servicing consumption and accumulation in the global north. This requires, this requires reversing IMF structural adjustment programs, canceling unpayable debts, and ending unequal exchange. None of this will happen on its own. It will require a major political struggle against those who profit so prodigiously from the status quo. To get there, we must build alliances between environmentalists and labor movements and other progressive political formations. This is not a time for timid responses, tweaking around the edges of an obviously failing system. This is a time for courage. Is there hope? Yes. But our hope can only ever be as strong as our struggle. So build the struggle. Focus on the future we need. A just and ecological economy for the 21st century. Thank you.
So indeed, um, uh, that <laughs> indeed is the the end of the presentation from um, from Jason Heckel. Maybe now we can move on to the Q and A part. But I first of all wanted to ask um, our live speakers, so Vidya and Yamina and uh, Andrew, if uh, there was anything that you wanted to react to, and anything that the other speakers said that you didn't have a chance to uh, react to before we move on to the Q&A, uh, where I see we already have some of you um, voting up a number of the different things. So Vidya, I think you were first up, but have probably been listening patiently to the, to the others. Thank you so much. I, such wonderful presentations. I'm really, I'm really honored to be part of, um, of this event and, and to hear from, from, from folks. And I think there was quite a bit of resonance across what, uh, folks were sharing around this idea of um, degrowth and post growth and challenging, um, you know, how, how we see ourselves, the, the idea of growth narratives and progress narratives, I think are so fundamental um, to both capitalism and colonialism and how things are playing out right now. And, and I often in, in this work, think about um, what do we need to undo on multiple levels? Uh, Adrian Marie Brown talks about uh, the fractal nature of this work. Fractal being that you know what's happening on the on the most micro you know micro level is also playing out in ripples at the macro level. And so, what needs to be undone in us as individuals, uh, in in our relations, in our institutions, uh, in our in our relations with the more than human world? What what are the pieces that continuously need to be undone that give rise to um, the need for growth and progress? Um, uh, as such salient organizing uh, themes uh, in this world. And so these are just some things that I'm thinking about um, in listening to others. Thank you. Uh, and Jamina, and by the way, in the meanwhile, Anna Smedeby has, uh, has uh, uh, is now joined, joined us, so she'll be joining the moderation team shortly. But uh, Yamina, did you want to come back on something? I saw you posted uh, a comment in the chat. Uh, no, we, I did not post comment. Actually, I was answering to a question that someone sent, okay. but I couldn't an answer just her uh, about the uh, carbon budget issues. But uh, I don't know who. I don't remember the name. But uh, this person can come back to me, and we can. Uh, I can explain how I did the calculations. Actually, and they included a reference to that. Uh, I would like to thank Thomas for inviting me to this conference. I really enjoyed the discussion uh, because I am currently most of my work is related to the coloniality of uh, climate scenarios and climate neutrality targets, etc. So it was really good to hear uh, from other speakers what they are doing uh, and how they do approach this. And I personally stagger, struggle with colonialism as a concept and with coloniality because of the history of my family. So I went to the Algerian and the French school. In the Algerian school, I liked very much your presentation about the education. So in the Algerian school, I learned that uh, all what happens to the Algerians is due to the colonialism. And in the French school, I learned that uh, without colonialism, Algeria would have never been a civilized country. So a complete negation of uh, like if Algeria did not exist before, the whole culture did not exist before. Um, and just being as uh, looking to uh, climate change issues from colonialism perspective is quite challenging for someone who uh, who is living in in the, who is experiencing colonialism in it's in my everyday life because sometimes my brain is you know I question what I'm doing and uh, I question a lot of things so I'm I'm happy that uh, my scientific work what I do in my daily life is. Uh, helping me to uh, overcome my struggles as a person who is uh, part of this heritage. Thank you. Okay, so maybe uh, now I should just introduce uh, Anna Smedeby, who's joined us. Uh, uh, unfortunately, she had a clashing meeting, but Anna Smedeby is uh, also one of the founders of EU Staff for Climate, and it's going to be helping me and Alexandra with the uh, question and answers uh, for our panel of Vidya and Yamina and Andrew. So, Anna, over to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Obi. It's great to be here, and I'm sorry I'm, I was late. Uh, so, let's look at the Slido. 
And there is one question which is definitely sailing way ahead of the others. Um, and I was wondering if what the speakers would like to uh, respond to it. Should there be a limit to people's wealth to facilitate redistribution among people and continents? That's a tough one. I can see Andrew there. Do you want to say something about this? Sure. I mean, I can, I, I'll just speak very personally that I believe I take inspiration from, from nature, I think is what comes to mind, at least for me, is that, that the world is full of, of limits, but not so much limits being imposed upon us as limits that we, that we self enforce upon ourselves or that we should in a manner that that's responsible and respectful of the of the others in the world within which we inhabit so so to me an endless accumulation of wealth is 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 just it's unnatural uh, if you look to the natural world and so i i feel quite strongly that well it's obviously very difficult from a very top-down policy EU type of perspective. What should that limit be? But I don't think, to me, there shouldn't be a question on, you know, should we collectively limit ourselves for the greater good and for the good of you know ourselves as humans and the rest of the non-human world? And so I would I would advocate for thinking along those lines. And then of course, the specific like, okay, what is it 30% of inequality, you know, should the richest person be 30 times more than the poorest person or 50 times or 100 times? I'm not sure. But I, I think a starting point would be to have that conversation. And currently, the number is hundred, you know, thousands of times more between the richest and the poorest. So, you know, I don't think it would do anyone too much harm to to bring it down to at least advocate for a hundred times and even that is how do you defend that um so i'll leave it there i i can see vidya nodding uh in her window do you want to speak to this sure i will yeah i very much um uh I agree with what what andrew was saying and you know i i think that um there might also be some structural pieces that we can consider here as well. You know, I think for so many governments um, and, uh, and, and and nations, the can, you know, there's so much uh, shirking of responsibility around the taxation of the rich. Um, it becomes a major political platform that 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 many people operate out of, and and uh, there has to be, you know, if. Um, there will always be loopholes in which people will find ways to uh, uh, house their wealth in, in, in ways that, 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 that others don't know about. But there have to be nations uh, and governments that are committed to taxing, taxing the rich at appropriate levels um, and redistributing that wealth elsewhere, uh, especially internationally in, in, in thinking about international development work. And I think that, you know, Another thing for us to really think about is I'm thinking about what Farhana was sharing in her in her video, like this, this um, consumerist consumption mentality is what's at the root of why we have particular people as wealthy as they are. You know, I have <laughs> had a big, big discussion right now with friends and family about um, about Tesla and all of the, you know, all of the complications uh, that are involved in that. And I look at the way that so many people are just um, wanting, wanting this, so regardless of the outcomes of, regardless of um, what increased wealth for, for particular folks with particular politics will do in, in, in the world. And so, um, you know, and I'm all for electric cars, but there's, there's a, there's, we create in many ways and we allow in many ways with consumerist and consum um, cultures, these, particular individuals who are well above um, the uh, wealth of, of, of others. And so how, how do we also take responsibility as people who are, we are co-creating each other in a world where we see each other as deeply interdependent. These individuals don't just make it on their own. They are constructed by all of us. 
Um, and so how do we undo that thinking as well that has created this uh, in the first place? Yeah. Thanks, Yamina, do you wanna say something about this yeah. as well? Yeah, uh, actually I like very much the question because uh, it raises other questions is how the wealth has been built of these people. And when you go to how this wealth has been built, you will realize that it, it was built by exploitation of uh, either the South or, for example, today, the more, th the more wealthy people that we have in the global North. Uh, it's because they managed to have no taxation, etc., you know, tax invasion, things like that. All these are injustices, not just North, South, and just, but even for us in uh, and uh, and doing all that, because when this behind this question, we need to do, of course, I don't have the full picture, but I know uh, about the wealth of some people that was built in uh, by exploiting the, the system for putting the system, the political system became is no longer in democracies is no longer working for the majority. It became system democracies today work for the minority to increase the wealth of the minority. So that's why our democracies are becoming more fragile. And that's why this question is a very good question, because if we go back to how did this wealth was built, uh, and then you will see that there is no reason for uh, some people to be extremely wealthy, because you will be um, as wealthy as you can produce the wealth. Can you produce billion of euros as one person? You cannot. You can do it only if you exploit other people. So that's why it's a very really good question. And I think we should uh, try to analyze it deeply. Thank, Thank you very you. much. It's it's Alex. Yes, uh, uh, we see in the questions some questions about the narrative. There are two next questions. One is how to reconcile global climate justice with a prevailing political narrative that the EU climate action raises costs for uh, ordinary man. So it's a narrative and uh, raising costs. And the next question, I'd like to address it as well because. Uh, Catherine is asking, I work in SUS Inc, I'm not so sure what it means, and struggle to bring a decolonial, just plus truthful discourse into mostly Eurocentric, patriarchal corporate spaces. How do we start? So there's a question here. How do we start? What's the next step practically in our everyday lives to change the narrative? Maybe <laughs> who can take this one? I, I can take this one. I can start if you want. If the yes, two yeah. others agree, yeah. Uh, so uh, the question of colonialism in the case of France. So for me, colonialism is against human rights, but it's not recognized as, the, as it is against human rights. So we do recognize in the French law that slavery uh, is not compatible with human rights, but we do not recognize yet that the French colonialism, colonialism in general, and in the case of France, was against human rights. So this is for me the first step. So we cannot have any um, rational debate in the case of France about colonialism uh, because we don't have this legal recognition. And then politicians keep playing the, the game of, uh, we in France, what we call uh, les pieds noirs are the French people who were born in the formal colonies, and then uh, these people are against any recognition of what the colonialism did in these countries. Um, so for me, it's a legal issue beca because colonialism is not recognized as something wrong legally. I don't know of any recognition, but maybe, maybe you know that it, exists. it does, does not exist in my country. Then the second thing is how to, to change the narratives. I did, in my case, I decided to work at the EU level because at the French level, I faced racism as a PhD student at the university. My PhD supervisor this told me that she will never hire, uh, she calls us French from the outside. This is how we are called. And she will never hire someone. So that's why uh, as PhD student, I was a good hire for her because this opened for her a door to have um, a contract with the uh, ADEM, the French Energy Agency, because I had scholarship from the French Energy Agency. That was the reason why she, she accepted me as PhD student. It was not my, the, what I wanted to study or whatever. And then, so I, uh, when I was PhD student, I realized that by going outside France in the rest of the EU, so basically the EU saved me uh, by going, I went to Denmark and to Germany. I was there as just scientist, as PhD student. And then maybe if I go for drinks with people, when we are drunk, people might ask me, where, are, where am I from? Where is my name from? Which is not the case in France. In France, I am first Algerian, female, and maybe, my brain can be useful, maybe. That's the third. 
And uh, then I decided to work at the, then I realized that at the EU level, I am just, I'm first what I am, and then my origin comes later on, if I would like to go to this origin. And it's interesting when I was, I was during two years at uh, the GRC, and then when I came back to France, I went to a meeting, uh, it was uh, after COP uh, in Paris, and then uh, at that meeting, someone asked me, he came to me asking me question because of my name, uh, because uh, there was this, they were discussing something about Morocco, and in his mind, because it was about Morocco, and given my name, so I understand very well what's going on in Morocco. Then I told him, why are, he said, you understand these things only me out of 20 people. And he said, because of your name. And when you are scientists and you are experiencing this in 20, 2015, 2016, that was, but still today, I am very often uh, uh, sent to my origin, the box of my origin. And all this is built, there is a system. It's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, colonialism is still in different institutions. It is in the university. It is in the research institutions. And if we do not um, break all that, and I do believe that the only hope that, and the only hope I have is that the EU will break all that. Because from my experience, when I am at the EU level, I am just the scientist that I am. And uh, it will never happen. And how can you change narratives? And in, in my case, I am well graduated. I am fully integrated to the French system. I am the result of the French school. And I don't even imagine the daily life of the, those who, who have an uh, uh, origin uh, from, uh, who, are, who are originally from, uh, their parents are from one of the French colonies, who have no degree. Uh, they are not uh, fully integrated. They did not went to the French school. They don't speak well, etc. I cannot even imagine how their daily life could be. And this is, we cannot, and uh, I keep explaining to my colleagues at the university that I cannot change that become, because what I am makes them reacting like that. So it's only the institutions that could change that. And, and this is where we need the EU for that, actually. Uh, what my dream is to have the EU at some point, I don't know where in the EU, to have a recognition, EU recognition that colonialism goes against human rights. And then uh, it can come only from different level. It, we cannot expect this from colonial countries. I, I don't know what, how is the British situation, but I am sure that we cannot, I do not expect any recognition from the French side. Thank you. Thank you as for a Brit, as a Brit, I would not necessarily suggest that we look for a lot of hope in, in that context. But um, there are some interesting comments in the uh, in the chat as well while you were speaking, Irina. Uh, Tom there was saying that uh, uh, looking at the future, I think we have to abandon the idea of any trade-off between the well-being of Europe and the well-being of non-Europe. And he's saying that he constantly proposes having experts from the south of the world. Um, Tom, did you want to kind of express what you what you were saying there in the chat? Now, there has been a lot of uh, of wisdom uh, today, and uh, I, I share what I, I, Andrew was 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 mentioning. I mean, myself in my life, uh, I know very well what does it mean to be white and man. I, I can enter whichever restaurant I want I want in the world, and so on. I mean. This is a heavy, a heavy situation. Even if uh, uh, we are on the on the best of the on the better of the two sides. Now the point is that when we develop ideas, um, we are still in a trade-off. In a trade-off that what is convenient to Europe is not necessarily convenient for the rest of the world. But we know that environment, energy balance, uh, the acidification of the oceans, uh, and you name it, uh, this is not something that will take care of which side of the table you are. And uh, until Cartesio was mentioned by the first speaker, and until Cartesio, we had a spiritual attitude. So we thought that there is a God and uh, the man exists because there is a, a, a God that inspires uh, the man and the woman. With Cartesio, cogito ergo sum, so we exist because we think. So that God is death, eh? to use Nietzsche now, we jump, we jump uh, from one to another. And, um, and the nature, uh, can live without uh, the humankind. I mean, we can disappear. Uh, we can disappear. And for the first time in the history, we have the consciousness that uh, it is not written that everybody, everything will go well. Everything can go very bad. So we had to be together and we had to develop this togetherness. 
And uh, the European mechanism, I think, that is what it's proposed inside the House, uh, should take into account experts from the south of the world. We should have, uh, when we shape the ideas, these kind of points of view, because we simply don't have this point of view. And uh, we need to open up the windows of our minds. And this means involving in the mm, idea sh uh, shaping experts from the south of the world. So uh, various colleagues who are commenting in the chat. I think Jean, uh, Jean-Philippe Arambeau, you, uh, you mentioned something a little bit earlier. Did you want to, when you said, I doubt we can change the system, or what did you, what's stopping us? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to change the whole system, how people are, you know, all the background that they have, that the societies has all this, you know, preconceived version, conception of, you know, all the racism that's there. I think the easiest would be to use it. You know, you know the rules. If you know that people by default behave that way, you could use those principles and rules to steer the system rather than convincing everything to go the opposite way. Playing a bit, not knowing that you can add some principles. So, you know, you hide the names by default, for example. You know, that's something if you cannot discriminate using this, then your system is more more stable. So rather than trying to yeah, convince the whole system that this is the way to go, use the rules they're employing, not against them, but to steer the system itself rather than convert every single person, which would take years. I mean, we have 20 years to fix the system or less, so. Okay, so Anna's pleading for us to go back to the question. So, Anna. Yeah, there are a number of really interesting questions in the Slido and I, I almost, fancy grouping some of them together, even though they might not completely fit. But um, one is, does the act of Europeans moving to countries that are already colonized by Europeans continue to reinforce colonial dynamics? And then I am connecting that one up with should EU institutions act on new fossil fuel companies projects exporting crude oil from the majority world countries to minority world countries? And um, the question about hydrogen projects, EU hydrogen projects with Africa from a colonialism thinking perspective. Because um, I'm thinking that there is a link here with um, keeping the colonialism going with the extraction of uh, raw materials and, and reinforcing the dynamics. Um, would anybody like to speak to either or all of these questions? So just, just speak out. Maybe Andrew hasn't said anything for a while, so. All right, all right. I shall, and I do have to acknowledge once again uh, my gratitude for having this conversation, but also that I, it's it's uncomfortable, and that's the purpose that brings it, you know, that brings us to the fore. And I've been very inspired by, in particular, Vidya, the words that I can see you you've put thought into articulating these concepts, and I'm very inspired by by finding the words to, so that being said, that's my caveat for not being able to find the words right now. But um, I think that it seems logical to me that if Europeans are moving to countries that are already colonized by Europeans, uh, then there would be a certain element of reinforcing colonial dynamics because you would essentially be be part of that dynamic. So I think that it's, it's about how can we, or I guess, again, Vidya, it, it, one of the things that you mentioned about, you know, like, how do we recognize what we need to undo? And I think all of us need to be part of that conversation. But in many cases, those people like, like me, who have grown up in generally as a white passing, enjoyed all the privileges of, of you know, generally fitting into a a settler state white supremacist organized structure 
that we would not be <laughs> kind of the first to be called upon and that what there is often a need for is to hear the voices of of those who have been those who have been marginalized in in these yeah in the in the overall process so i'll i don't really have a great response although i'll give it a shot to get the conversation going thanks uh, but that was actually one one question which was related to, which, which we didn't give it, you a chance to answer on the uh, in the previous set of questions, which was about the role of the ordinary man. And there's maybe uh, something you could say about that, um, that the uh, adapting to um, because that, that's part of your social social threshold as well. How are the people who are below the social threshold supposed to be contributing to? Um, tackling the planetary emergency and could that be uh, as a next consequence something which then brings out the populist side of things yes yes and i i didn't really have time to to go through that in the presentation itself but i'm glad for the question because i guess on those on those financial results that i presented around compensation for atmospheric appropriation a couple points worth emphasizing i was thinking after about that this compensation would be owed for atmospheric appropriation, assuming the world reaches net zero by 2050. And that should be con that that should be considered additional to the act of actually actually getting there. So the cost of transition the, or adaptation to the damages that are already baked in, all of those I would see as additional to, you know, making comfort compensation for the loss of, of a, a, a portion of a country's fair share. And when it comes to that liability to pay, then definitely we need to pay very, very close attention to class inequalities, in particular within the Global North country. So we did a national level analysis, but responsibility for those excess emissions has been well proven to be largely held by the wealthiest classes. And of course, they wield disproportionate power over production, consumption, national policies, the things that Jason was talking about in his video. And so I, I think there's very strong arguments to be made for the wealthiest to be the ones who will be paying the costs for that compensation. And as well, we can learn from in France and in other places that when equity and class are not considered in supposedly green initiatives, like we can look to the Gilets Jaunes movement, that essentially that, that, that argument that things hit the ordinary man and therefore it causes them to uprise, that is to a certain extent true, but that doesn't mean that we don't do anything. That means that we need to make sure that our policies are not only achieving climate and environmental targets, but they're doing so in a just way. And, and so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Can I just link in here with a question in the Slido about the, the poor in the global north? Um, you know, you, you were mentioning that, whether you want to speak a little bit to that in conceptual terms, where are they located? You talked about the Gilets Jaunes, but maybe say something more. Sure. I mean, I would say every country has a distribution of those who are the wealthiest and those who are those who are most marginalized or vulnerable. Of course, it's going to be different contexts by different countries, but often there's well known. I mean, statistically, we can look at the groups of you know newly landed immigrants. We can look by race. We can look by gender. We can. So that there are there are intersections within which those characteristics characteristics meet, and because of course a person is not just one thing, as Yamina was saying, right? She's, we're not just you know of from Algeria or from Canada or from wherever. We have a bundle of characteristics which provide some with more privilege than others, and I think a lot of that has to do with luck and where we were born. And so coming to grips as somebody that I feel quite privileged. Uh, it's how do you recognize that and how do we build build systems that are in service to those who are you know least well off rather than the most well off and yeah I think that's that's I can't answer your your question in specific specific detail because that'll take us into individual countries but I think it's generally can I say a few words about the the yellow vest movement in France Please. Yeah. So when you look at climate policies and especially uh, so uh, to how to finance climate action, we usually rely most of our policies rely on uh, 
uh, market instrument. Market instruments are not designed to deliver on justice. They are designed for uh, the wealthiest part of the society. So the case of Yellow Vest Movement is very good uh, uh, illustration of that because it was designed uh, to, it's a carbon tax that was designed without taking into account the impact of this new tax on those because the Yellow Vest Movement, the people who did the Yellow Vest Movement are not poor people. They have jobs, but they are uh, low income people. Uh, and these people have been trapped in uh, the urban sprawl and the imaginary and the narratives about uh, the good life when you live outside the city uh, and you need uh, you have a house with a garden. This, this, these are the pictures that we had when we were kids. Huh? Uh, you have a house with a garden, your kids, everyone is happy. They never show you that you end up uh, with your car. You need a car even to buy your bread or to, uh, to go to school, etc. And then you end up spending so many hours in your car because of traffic jam. All these pictures, is, is, we don't see it. And the, the new thing is that given that we also put in, we consider that all jobs should be in, the market decides about everything. And uh, this is why uh, the salaries, uh, we did not experience an increase of the salaries. Actually, the, the increase of the cost of life the, um, was not, uh, we don't see an increase in the salaries that allows us to pay for the increase of the cost of uh, living. And this is why these people now they are at risk of becoming poor. And when this this uh, uh, this uh, carbon tax came, so it made these people poor. Actually, it would have made these people poor, not able to pay for their uh, daily trips that they need to go to to their jobs to to make this uh, living actually. And uh, but the answer that we got, it, it has never been analyzed like that from our government side. The answer that we got is that uh, uh, these people were considered, so actually there, there are even a new analysis that shows how the government organized the infiltration of any social movement following this, uh, uh, the Yellow West movement. So it, it, it's even uh, uh, the response that we got from the government has, is threat to the democracy actually. Uh, and if we would have had sufficiency policies, we would have never had Yellow Vest movement. Because if you have sufficiency policies, then you will work on the well being of all, and especially the vulnerable ones. Then you will not have mobility poverty. Because we have mobility poverty, and France is a good case study because we have um, a law on mobility, a new one adopted uh, recently with uh, Macron, since Macron has been elected. It's called La Loi de l'Orientation. De mobility. But in this law, there is, the word mobility poverty does not appear. So you have a law adopted in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, or 2020, and that does not recognize the reality of an important share of the population who is facing mobility poverty. So, and this is when you do this, what do you expect as a response as policymaker? I think they are looking for uh, for a war, for an internal war in our countries. Actually, the, when when you look at the details of the policy of the policies that we had, and when I say this, actually, it comes from the EU. So this is where the EU has a role to play because most of the EU instruments for financing are market-based instruments. Market-based instruments are not were not thought to deliver on justice. They are thought to deliver to make more money for those who are already making money. So we cannot solve the problem with market-based instruments. So Zach has made his comment in the in the chat. Thank you. And then um, Fitio has been patiently waiting with her hand up, but I also need to bring in Laurent Bontu before the end. So Vitya, maybe you'd like to say something quickly before then. Sure. So I'll just I'll just share here. I've been getting um, you know, I think I think this discussion is a really good example of the kind of work that needs to be done. And I wanna uh, invite us to think about how the the urgency with uh, towards um climate justice is um can in many ways replicate colonial patterns and narratives i just want to caution us around that and i'm noticing here i'm getting some private messages as well as some messages in the in, in the slido um specifically around the notion of christian hegemony and i think this is a, a good place to sort of practice this idea of being being uncomfortable, the very thing that needs to happen for us to do this work well and not to replicate colonial narratives as we're trying to address climate issues. Um, and I'll, I'll say here that, you know, when we talk about the, he the, the hegemony of any group uh, that is th that is in power, it's not to say that everybody in that group 
or that individuals in that group are, are bad people. That's not what this is about. This is actually about a systemic way of thinking about how particular narratives have dominated the world. And if we can't start with that as a point of truth, and in Canada, we have the truth and reconciliation that we are um, failing to live up to, but we are trying, uh, I'll say, but Oftentimes, you'll hear Indigenous people in Canada say there is no rec reconciliation without truth. So if we can't admit the truth of the ways in which Christianity as an, as, as an, organi as an organ organizing body, white supremacy as an organizing economic, political, cultural system, uh, coloniality, again, imperialism, if we can't acknowledge the ways in which these systems have and continue to wreak havoc, um, in, in the world, then we can't possibly do this work in a way that's not going to replicate that. And so the invitation here is to divest from the willingness to be pure and innocent and benevolent and influential. These are, these are fantasies. F folks like um, Vanessa Andriotti uh, in, at the University of British Columbia talk about the fantasies of, of wanting to be seen as pure and benevolent and innocent. And these fantasies, this desire to want to be seen this way, either as individuals or as nations or as an entire European Union, uh, create the conditions for us to always create something that is wrong, that is bad, that is other, and to deny uh, the ways in which we are, are complicit in the very things that we're trying to, to change. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fiji. Well, I just need to introduce Laurent Bontu, uh, who is a senior foresight expert at the Joint Research Center. And, uh, and uh, he has the unenviable challenge of uh, trying to summarize uh, the discussion that, uh, that we've been having. Laurent. Yeah, thanks, thanks, a lot, Obi. thanks very much. Thank you very much, Obi. Um, unenviable challenges. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to try to summarize what has been discussed because I, I must say that I, I want to congratulate all the speakers for the richness of what they've been able to share with us. Um, so I, I, I'm going to try to just pick up a few points, you know, that I found quite salient in the conversation um, and, and help people draw their own conclusions from this event. But um, summarizing everything, I think it was too rich to be able to do this in two minutes. Um, so I think what's clear is that we know well what the, the scale and nature of uh, our existential problem is, you know, the sustainable development issue, you know, is it, very clear. We are overshooting six planetary boundaries. Um, and then the rest of the discussions, I think, made clear, you know, what point that the Albert Einstein was making, that we cannot solve any problem by using the same reasoning that actually led to the emergence of this problem. And I think that what Vanya was saying, for example, was really clear in terms of, you know, helping us understand the importance of reframing how we understand the world in order to be able to actually start to think about new, new, new solutions. So, you know, having to overcome these colonial mindsets, uh, which very often for us, actually, on our side, you know, it, it is a set of ideas that give us a sense of success. You know, that's the, the mindset that help us bring what or bring to the fore what we consider as being successful. And I think that's becoming now very dangerous when we're considering how many planetary boundaries are overshot. And um, so we need to be able to get over this to allow us to reframe our thinking in order to be able to come up with uh, new visions of a positive, sustainable future. And in particular, you know, having the capacity to actually overcome this sense of superiority over nature, uh, the superiority of man over nature. Um, and, and here, I think that we, we had this discussion about the atmosphere being a human common. So this is something that could help us actually understand that we are part of nature. This common is something in which we are all breathing. And so we have to really uh, use these kind of pictures, I think, to be able to understand that we're not separate from nature. Uh, and also coming on the point of separation, you know, um, the conversation that we've just heard, you know, have really helped us understand that it is dangerous to feel too separate from the others and too separate from nature at the same time, because the future is likely to become, I mean, if we want the future to be successful, we have to build collaboration to be able to overcome these huge challenges that we're facing. Uh, and 
that is something that brings to the fore the need for trust and the need for fairness. And we heard uh, Vanessa Nakate tell us about trust and how important trust is. And I think trust is essential to be able to overcome separation. And this is also necessary to be able to address all these fairness issues that we've heard about, you know, in all our conversation. And another point that I found really important was the one made by Yasmina, you know, about sufficiency, that we need to bring the concept of a sufficiency from the academic debate into the policy debate. And um, the idea of, you know, bringing forward a definition, you know, of sufficiency actually could be very useful to bring this into uh, the policy debate. Um, and so all these problems about fairness, inequalities that we've also heard a lot about, you know, have weakened our democracy. And so that's something that we need to, to, to address. And um, the fact that colonialism should be recognized as being against human rights, I think is also a, a very important point. Uh, and, and that could all also help us create new narratives. So being able to overcome this colonial mindset can help us create better narrative, more in tune with the time and help us recognize that very often the images of the future that we're carrying are what so highly Nayatullah, you know, a foresight expert would call used futures. You know, they are images of the futures which are no longer useful and create more problem than they solve. And so we have to, to be able to, to use new frames to create new futures that are more in tune with the challenges of the time to be able to actually create these positive visions of what sustainability could be both at European level and also at, at global level, so that we understand then what everybody's share and part in the game could be in order to be able to overcome our existential challenges. And here, uh, I would like to make a reference to a GRC project, or at least a research program called Enlightenment 2.0, that can help us get over the Enlightenment, Enlightenment 1.0 and the, the rationality by helping us understand human nature, human psychology, uh, how our minds work, and also uh, some of the work they've done on values, you know, um, rec reconciling uh, values and identities and helping us understand how values can be mobilized to actually create a positive future. And I think that could be applied maybe uh, to, to the reflection on the future vision for the EU. My personal impression is that the EU started as a community of values uh, that was meant to make sure that there would be no longer war in Europe because Europe was the, the cradle of two terrible world wars. And I have the feeling that we have slowly shifted towards a purely economic vision in where the single market has become, you know, the soul of the project. And we see now with all these economic developments leading to exhaustion of the resources, really to uh, the limits of this economic centric vision. And so we have to be able to get over this colonialism type of thinking to be able to reopen, uh, recreate a sense of fairness, shared uh, sense of destiny on the, on the earth to, to be able to, to inject into our own policy making work. So I don't, I don't want to speak any more than this. I, I hope that the, this, you know, look at the conversations that we've had in a slightly different uh, frame. And I'm looking forward to continue conversations on this topic with many of my colleagues and, and many of you in the future, because the task is going to be long and is not going to be finished after this particular talk. So thank you very much, Obi. Thank you very much, Thomas and everybody else. And uh, talk again soon. Thomas, I think it's you now who has to say the final words and over to you. Wow, I think I'm impressed as probably many of us about uh, those uh, two hour rich debates about essential and about uh, existential questions. So I'm happy that we've all been here together and I'm also, I think, uh, very happy uh, for having put uh, this talk uh, together. And I'm so much thanking all the speakers uh, for their contribution uh, and uh, all the participants for uh, interacting so vividly. And thank you to all and uh, all the best. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>